and welcome to another edition of Glumcon's new series on high impact clinical trials in GN. My name is Manasi Bape. I'm a nephrologist at Kaiser Permanente in Walnut Creek in California. I'm Vinay Srinivasan. I'm the director of emerging therapeutics for Glomcon, and I'm an academic nephrologist at Cooper University Hospital in New Jersey. And today we're thrilled to have Dr. Peter Merkel. Dr. Merkel is the chief of the rheumatology division and a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an internationally recognized expert in vasculitis and scleroderma. Dr. Merkel, we're really thrilled to have you today. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us. Pleasure. Um, if I can ask the first question, Dr. Merkel, can you give us a brief um, overview regarding um, the rationale for uh, complement inhibition in um, the in ANCA associated vasculitis um, and the purpose of advocate trial, uh, which we are going to talk about today and um, uh, its design? Thank you. Uh, I think this is a great series and I'm happy to talk about the advocate trial. So the C5A receptor inhibitor has been in, was in development for quite a while before the phase three trial. And the reason there was excitement and the reason it was even investigated is because there are some animal models and some human data strongly suggesting that complement activation is an important part of the pathophysiology of ANC associated vasculitis. Uh, there were some very nice animal models from the UNC group and some other work that's been done that sort of demonstrate that. With that in mind, the idea of, of interrupting the complement cascade as a way to target damage being done in ANC associated vasculitis at the point of damage, at the site of damage, in this case, the brainless, or it could be the nerve, it could be the lung, and to do so quickly was the idea. And so the animal models and the data all led to the idea of looking at C5A inhibition and the phase two trials, there were two phase two trials that led to the phase three trial. Uh, there was the CLEAR study led by my colleague uh, academically, David Jane, and then the classic trial, which I led in the United States. These are two phase two trials. One looked at some, uh, looking an early look at whether um, you could use a bacopan without uh, glucocorticoids or a reduced dose, and the classic looking at it in combination with uh, standard therapies from a safety standpoint. Those two studies, as well as the basic science behind it and all the pharmacodynamics, dynamics, led to working on a phase three design. So there was good translational research that led to the idea that this makes sense to look at the C5 a receptor inhibition in addition to other immunosuppressors. That's important to remember. This is in addition to recyclophosphamide or metoxamide. So that's the setup. And then you want me to talk a little bit about the design of Advocate. So Advocate was a randomized active comparator, visible control uh, phase three trial of this C5A receptor inhibitor. But it is a moderately complex study design in a way. Basically, assuming the standard of care, which it was at the time, was that patients would receive moderately high doses of glucocorticoids. The glucocorticoid dosing we did was, was standard for at the time, more or less between the high and low dose exavascular regimens, which we did another study. Um, fairly good paper, in addition to either rituximab or cyclophosphate. Standard of care. So that's the standard of care. What the experimental arm was, patients would receive either rituximab or cyclophosphamide. They would receive a bacopan, but they would not get any additional glucocorticoids after they were enrolled in the trial by protocol. So it was really a bacopan versus a prednisone taper plus reduction of the Now, that being said, patients had received some glucocorticoids prior to coming into the study. You don't enroll 10 minutes after you get your diagnosis. And knowing that investigators and patients would not be totally comfortable just stopping glucocorticoids that day, especially if they hadn't been on, we allowed up to 20 milligrams a day for the first 28 days, but you had to be at zero by day 28 regardless of which, based on, in addition to the protocol. This actually led to a very big change and many people, and, and it, it worked in that the patients who got Avacapan got much less glucocorticoids than the patients who were in the prednisone paper by design. The design of the trial was to look at remission, which was defined as a VVAS, which is this measure that we use to uh, measure disease activity. The outcome isn't VVAS, the outcome is remission no evidence of active disease as best we can make it clinically at weeks 26 and 52. So what gets confusing is that we go, so when you look, it goes from non-inferiority and then we have non-inferiority 26 and we have superiority and we go back to superiority. The reason, there's actually a very important design reason for that. It's a, called a hierarchical approach to looking at your outcomes is you don't go to the next one unless you reach the first. So you have to go to that at this at 26 and then 52 and then that and then go back. And that was how it was designed in order to preserve the integrity of the statistical plan. 
in the end, the question is, we're putting people on Vagapan and much less deeply ways for standard of care. How do they do it 26 and how do they do it? So in terms of sustained remission, um, Advocate not only showed um, non-inferiority uh, of Avacopan at 26, at week 26, but actual superiority um, was met at week week 52. Um, what do you think the reason was for that? Well, I think the reason for that is that the drug works, that the drug is effective in reducing disease activity in ANC-associated vasculitis, and it does it quickly. That's how it's designed, that pharmacologically makes sense. It's important to remember that at 26 weeks, they were equivalent, not inferior, it was really very close, the two groups. But the patients who got avocapin did so and on much less glucocorticoids. And we know from something called the glucocorticoid toxicity index or GTI, which is just a measure of exactly what it sounds like, toxicity from glucocorticoids, that they had less that because they got less glucocorticoids. We know their quality of life overall was the measurements were always in the right direction, in, in the direction of more of improve, better improvement in patients who got avocapin. So they did, they both groups did similarly well at 26, but one group did so without as much group work, which made them happy and, and was good. At, 20, at 52 weeks, we saw superiority. Now that tells us a couple of things. It's important to remember that patients were not redosed with rituximab. They got rituximab initially. We tend to often redose people now, but that was not the standard for the time. And it, it actually was useful from a trial standpoint, because what it tells us from 26 to 52 weeks is, hey, you're on this drug, Rocketman you're more likely to stay in remission. So this allows for maintenance of remission better than not being on it. So that tells you that it's effective. And so again, at 52 weeks, they were they were better, they were more likely to be in remission and receive much less than four weeks. It does not tell you what happens if you repeated rituximab at 26. So that is a common caveat to this, but it does tell you that the drug's effective by maintenance of remission. So it's help, it helpful both for Reduction Those are all really good points, Dr. Merkel. Um, another exciting result was that at week 52, the EGFR was higher in the group treated with the Vacapan, and the difference was most pronounced in patients with a lower baseline EGFR of less than 30 milliliters per minute. And uh, the 2024 KDGO and associated vasculitis guidelines now recommend a Vacapan as an alternative to glucocorticoids. Um, and what's your approach to considering a Vacapan or glucocorticoids alone in your patients? Well, you never go glucocorticoids alone. So it's always in addition to either sacrifice or maximize. So it's important to remember this is the data we have are adjunctive therapy to that backbone. Um, I want to go back up. Those data were very exciting and intriguing, but they are somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say exploratory, but they're, they're novel. We have not seen this type of difference in renal outcome in our patients yet. Um, so what you, what is it? There's a siren behind me. I hope that's not interesting. You're hearing all that. Um, so what that showed was, as a group, the patients who got a Vakapan, who started off with renal insufficiency, the patients who got a Vakapan had a sharper, had a steeper increase in GFR, regaining GFR than the patients who didn't get it. Both groups improved, but the group who got a Vakapan improved more. And they improved more by an amount that was it's considered by in nephrology to be important as a group level. It is an important increase in EGFR. What's intriguing about this is, what does it mean? It seems to be clinically significant, but what does it mean? I think it could mean one of several things. It could mean that this drug works quickly. You only get so many glomeruli in life and you'd like to preserve as many as possible. This is one of the major goals of what we're trying to do. And so it works quickly and therefore puts the fire out right away when it starts, which therefore you're now seeing six, eight, nine, 12 months later, the result of that, less damage, better recovery. It could also mean that what we call remission at 26 weeks, maybe it's not always remission. Maybe there's some smoldering disease or maybe there's some more reversible and maybe this drug is allowing you to do that and helping you do that. That's also possible and intriguing. We biopsy people, which we don't do. We, we are thinking about doing that more in our trials, but if you re-biopsy, we might find some evidence of continuing smoldering disease. The counter to that is, well, they don't seem to get worse per se, but it's probably there. We know in other glomerular diseases, lupus, which is a very different, pathophysiology, that type of approach is being taken more. So it does intrigue. The other possibility is it's an epiphenomenon and we, you know, we haven't seen that again, but we, we, we haven't looked. So I think it's very intriguing and it's very promising. I'd like to see 
more of that. It, it goes along with the hypothesis of we're trying to really treat fast and early to preserve renal function, allow for greater improvement. That, however, should not be the driving force for choosing this drug. It's an intriguing finding. I think driving force is the data we, we presented in the main paper, which is at 26 and 52 weeks. Going back to the second part of the question, which is what, what do I recommend? I recommend that patients, certainly patients with glomerular disease. So glomerular nephritis is a major and serious manifestation of anchor associated vasculitis. The majority of patients have renal disease. Not always the majority when they relapse because we already know about them, we get them early. But I think that this the, the drug is labeled for and appropriate for use in patients with severe anchor associated vasculitis. I think any degree of glomerular nephritis is severe disease and so it should be treated. So for patients with new onset or relapsing disease who have glucomerular nephritis or other severe manifestations, say neurologic involvement or bad scleritis or hemorrhage, lung hemorrhage, et cetera, lots of ways to be have severe disease. The majority of patients who newly present have severe disease, not so much the relapsers. Then you should follow the advocate regimen. So it's a, it's a treatment strategy. It's not like you just give the drug. It's giving the drug quickly, early in the course, in addition to rituxyrocyclophosphamide, and very strongly considering stopping glucocorrhage rapidly. Again, I would, once I started, if they under good control, but they, they seem to be responding, I would, if they've already received a week of high dose, for example, and they've pulsed, you'll start at 20 and you'll go down quickly in four weeks. That's in general. Like all guidelines, they're guidelines, whether they be key KDGO guidelines or the American College of Pathology guidelines. Guidelines are there to guide, but you have to treat the patient in front of you, and you have to feel comfortable that you're getting control of the disease before you start lowering things. There is no doubt that overall, over the years, we've been giving too much glucocorticoids, but the question is, which patient can you give less to? I think this allows substantial reduction in glucocorticoids. What I think is problematic is if you give the drug and then just keep giving glucocorticoids the way you always have, you're not getting advantage of that. Um, so I would use that, and I would tell you that the, the majority of patients, two-thirds of patients, in the advocate trial receive rituximab. And what we're seeing in, at least in the United States and increasingly in country after country where access to rituximab has become commonplace, the vast majority of patients are being started on rituximab and for repeat disease, they're getting rituximab over cyclophosphamide. The follow-up to that question, Dr. Merkel, uh, patients in advocate receive either cyclophosphamide or rituximab with effect in real life practice. How do we approach the role of avocapan in patients who receive combination induction therapy with cyclophosphamide and rituximab? Do they get a four-drug regimen of cyclophosphamide, rituximab, avocapan, and low-dose glucocorticoids? So I don't routinely recommend the use of a combination of rituximab and cyclophosphamide. We don't have good data supporting those uses. We have some case series, and we have some data supporting the fact that when you get the combination, there's a, a real increase in infection. The number one cause of death for patients with ankyl-associated vasculitis is infection. And if you combine cyclophosphamide with B-cell reduction and glucocorticoids, you're increasing the chance of severe infection. There's no clear evidence that you're gaining more from doing this. I know this is a strategy that is, I wouldn't say become popular, but it's used in some centers and some centers don't use it. It's used often in pediatrics, for example. And in general, those centers are using it, give two or three doses of, of cyclophosphamide up front and then just continue with the rituximab and everything else. The idea is you jumpstart this process. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. I, I, it's an area of debate in the field. Um, the outcomes we get when we use one or the other drug are really quite good. Um, and there's no evidence that if your creatinine is higher, you have more, less, more or less responsive disease. Actually, with data suggests that's not the case. That all being said, if you're going to use this drug, I would use it the way we used it in the trial. The trial did not use the combination. Nonetheless, I think if you're going to use the combination, given what we know to date, which is about the safety of this drug, I think it's probably fine to give it in addition to both cyclophosphamide and rituximab. Safety profile is very strong for Vakban based on hundreds of patients, not thousands of patients that have received the drug. There's, there was a question of a signal of hepatic, we have to follow hepatic function, other things, but in general, it has not been associated with infections. I'd be much more concerned about combination of the two. Additionally, I know this is a long answer, but additionally, one of the real concerns of driving of infection in our patients with anchor associated vasculitis is of course the cyclophosphamide rituximab, but it's really also the glucocorticoids. So if you're actually using both and you're lowering glucocorticoids, you're lowering the risk of infection. So that's probably one of the most key features of doing this. I'd refer back to our PEXAVAS study. So I, I was the, one of the three PIs for that study. And what we showed in that trial was that a reduced dose of glucocorticoids compared to the so-called standard at the time 
equal efficacy, but fewer severe infections. So if you extrapolate from that, careful, you extrapolate, lowering glucocorticoids is really always good, whether it's cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Merkel. That's really helpful. Um, and uh, my final question is, what are you most excited about uh, in terms of future therapies or therapies in pipeline for um, ANCA-associated vasculitis? Well, I think there's, there's, uh, I think it's good to look back. I'm old enough to know when we really only had cyclophosphamide as our immunomodulatory agent in addition to glucocorticoids, which was a breakthrough. I might add, advanced first by uh, Andy Stewart Novak, who did the first eight, four patients, but really advanced by Tony Fauci at the NIH and Shelley Wolf and company. And we have to re remember that they were really the legacy that brought this idea of using immunosuppressive agents like this for autoimmune diseases. But it was a breakthrough then, but it had a cost. Chronic use of cyclophosphamide for a year or more had substantial toxicities, but it improved mortality tremendously. We're now gone away from that. So you have to see the progress we've made is fantastic. This disease has really become, it's gone from a highly mortal, acute disease to a chronic relapsing disease, worse that we, and most patients do well if they've caught in time. And once they're under treatment, they do quite well because we're aware of them. So I think that's important to remember. It's really a different disease when properly managed. Not perfect by any means. What I'm excited about are strategies to try to intervene right away and get people off glucocorticoids or and preserve their renal function and their neurologic function, et cetera, right away. I think complement inhibition, there are I, I have to be careful not to divulge things that I become confidential, but there are a number of different pathways within complement that are being looked at. C5A, C3, factor H, these are all public. Very intriguing things. There are other pathways to interfere with neutral function and macrophages and other aspects of the inflammasome and the, and the, and the inflammatory pathways involved that are very intriguing and may allow for not just glucocorticoid sparing, but maybe you don't need B-cell depletion as long, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of in interesting agents that are being looked at. Once you have, we've had two drugs approved for ANC associated vasculitis, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge. It's huge, it's changed the field. And once you show that pathway, companies and investigators are more interested in moving that forward. I think we're gonna look for smaller changes, maybe subgroups, et cetera. There's still a lot of patients that need better care. We have chronic recurrent disease that requires glucocorticoids and it interferes with patient's quality of life and even longevity. So we have to be, we have more work to do. I would add one other intriguing area that we are studying here at the University of Pennsylvania others are thinking about, and that is CAR-T19 therapy. So uh, we're about to start a basket trial that will include patients with ankyl-associated vasculitis. Do I think there are a lot of patients who might need this upfront? Probably not yet until we prove it because we do very well with rituximab. But one of the issues with chronic use of rituximab is chronic B-cell depletion and is A, it doesn't always work. B, you get risk of infection. C, you have poor vaccine responses and your vaccine responses go down your humoral immunity. We certainly learned that in the terrible consequences during the uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID pandemic. And so cell therapy, CAR-T19 in particular, offers the potential for a drug-free existence afterwards if we're able to actually reset the immune system so that there aren't pathogenic B-cells involved and the patients no longer need to be B-cell deplete and they have normal immunoglobulin levels. That's a lot of things we have to show. The data in lupus is certainly intriguing and promising. We're doing that too. Looking for it in AV. These are experiments and they should be treated as such, but it's it shows you where we're at. So I think there's the range here. We just completed a trial of low-dose glucocorticoids, yes or no. There's There are a lot of data coming out to better manage patients that matter and in ways that matter to clinicians and matter to patients. Um, so I think the fact that we have options is a very happy problem. That's a good thing for our patients. And the fact that we have more people learning properly how to take care of glomerular disease is a good thing that you're doing. And I think we should work together, the rheumatologists and nephrologists should work together. As I like to say, I love, uh, I love nephrologists. I work closely with them. I love them so much, I married one. And so I think everybody should work with nephrologists and rheumatologists. Fair enough. Uh, we, we, we agree, Dr. Merkel. Uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with us and share your expertise. We greatly appreciate it. Happy thank to. You so I much. have to answer. I, lots of people send me questions and stuff. Happy to be involved. This is uh, it's a nice series. Thanks for asking me.